All right, my name is Josh Christensen. For you, those of you who don't know me, um, I've been investing for about 10 years. Um, all here in Salt Lake Valley, I started in mortgages and learned that investing was a little bit more fun, even though I still do them a little bit. Um, Randall was fortunate enough that his sister married my brother. And so I went on a hunting trip with my brother up to visit Randall. And we met up there. He was up in Oregon at the time. Uh, he was wanting to get into real estate because he was a contractor up there. So we talked a little bit. I came down. He eventually moved down here. And so we started doing business together. We do a lot of stuff together. Um, so that's a little bit about me. This presentation is a little bit different. Um, you came here to learn about real estate investing. And I promise you this does have to do with real estate investing. But I need your participation for the first little bit. I've got two questions. The first question is what makes you tick? And I do want responses for this. What I mean by this is what motivates you? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you want to go to work? Why do you want to do anything? Okay, money. There's one. More money. There's two. <laughs> What else? What was that? Quality of life. Quality of life. I like that. Very good. Thank you. Jane. Freedom. Freedom. What do you mean by freedom? Uh, I'm in charge of what I do. Okay. So because you're in charge of your own boss, when you get up in the morning, that motivates you. That helps you. You don't feel like you have to go to a job, per se. Is that yeah. kind of like that? Okay. I don't think I'd work for anybody else. <laughs> okay. Once, once you go, it's hard to go back. Yes? I like giving people jobs. Giving people jobs. I like that. Excellent. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yes? Okay. So you got friends you'd like to see. Okay. Can you do the next slide? Anyone else? Increasing that work for other people. Okay. Is that fun? Isn't that fun? That really is. Helping people, basically. Well, here's a couple of my uh, tickers, as I call them. These are my two little guys. Um, Baylor and Luke, as you can see from the birthday present on the right, that center picture, they love lawnmowers, and from the one on the left, that's the actual one that my two-year-old could actually drive at the age of two. Um, it scared grandma and mom, but we would we drive, I'd let him drive around the parking lot, and do 360s, and he'd go between the cars, and they're holding their breath, and <laughs> freaking out, but a lesson actually, really quick, side note. That I learned from that is I'd always have them on my lap and we'd drive around uh, mowing the lawn. And then one time I thought, you know, I wonder if he can do it. And he was two years old at the time. So I said, Baylor, why don't you try? And so I kind of started to do it. And I had to help him. Next time I did the same thing. Come the third time, he was doing it by himself. The lesson I learned from that is kids, I don't think we push our children as much as they can go sometimes. Some kids are pushed naturally raised in a bad situation or whatnot, but keep that in mind because you will change a life. And if you change a child's life, you'll change generations and you'll change the world. One thing I've learned. So anyways, these are some of my motivators. I love my little guys. Um, that's part of the reason I get up in the morning. I would have a picture of my wife, which she would have shot me, so I didn't put it up there, but she is obviously one too. Um, so anyways, we all have different motivations. You all do things. But we all want to improve and we all want to be successful. But there's certain things you have to do to be successful, and I believe this pay it forward is one of them. Go ahead and switch to the next one. Okay, this is in relation to question number one. Question number two is you know what makes you tick, kind of why you do things. What life changing experience have you had that helped you realize? what you enjoy, what motivates you. And you gotta think about this for a second, but I do want responses. A lot of times something happened, it was your aha moment, it was a paradigm shift, something happened in your life that changed you, that made you do things differently. I would love to hear a couple of stories on that. Anyone, Matt Atkinson. Uh, this year I determined that I don't have to work anymore. And how did that work? When did you, you realize that? What did that do? How did that change you? Well, uh, I took, honestly, I have more assets than debts. I have more income than liabilities. 
and I don't have to work anymore, but I'd be way bored. Mm -hmm. But what am I going to work out? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like need to make it. I wanted to, 
And so now it's like, if I'm not happy, it's not because I don't have enough money, it's just because I'm brainwashed by all, you know, the whole rules of society. So that was a huge breakthrough for me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I talk in the suburbs, right? You know, which is this 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 rough. And um, I mean, I slept in the little wagon. I just slept on the bridges. I just slept in the, the little cardboard boxes and stuff. You know, just survive. But especially in the winter time, is the hardest time. And like, uh, I could uh, fill out applications for a job and stuff. They look at me, you know, I'm not looking presentable. And then they, well, we'll call it a little number. But how can I leave a number when I don't have a phone? So, I, it's just a struggle out here. You know, I just, you know, from day to day, people, you know, I come out here and panhandle with my cup right here at the Metro Training Station. People come out, bring them in sandwiches and stuff like this here. And um, I start out in the morning by 6 o'clock. You know, sometimes I don't even have enough to go to the flop house. You know, sometimes the flop house is a cheap place and they number 16 bucks for 24 hours. Where they would have a car to bring you in. And uh, a lot of times I don't have enough money for that. So I had to end up sleeping in the park or on one of these benches downtown or something like this. And then the security guards come and run off about 5 or 6 in the morning. So by 6 o'clock I started to pan out and then try to survive. And, uh, like I said before, some days I wouldn't have enough to get a room, so I had to sleep on the sleep street. But I depended on the people that's coming off the train because most of them I give them respect. You know, most of them like me. They come out and give me clothes and food and stuff like this here. So I survived, give me a few bucks and everything, and I added up at the end of the day and give me a little room for the night. And whenever I'm not fortunate to get the room, I just sleep in the street wherever I can. It's really humiliating to be sick in a cup. 24 hours a day, and people just look at you like you're some kind of little bomb, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I have had people to walk past me and say, get a job, bomb. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not a bomb, I'm a human being. And it's, and it's hard. But after the end of the day, when, when people go home and everybody get on the metro train and they might and then I just feel so bad that I can't be going home. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. But uh, it's really emotional because I'm really trying to do myself to get off that street. You know, and I don't care what it's doing. If I can get a job, I do this humility. You know, I mean, you just lose all your humility when you're sick and a cook baby. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, you know, I mean, you know, you can look at a person and tell if they give you respect or not. You know what I mean? A lot of people look at you like you're just a, a piece of crawl. You know, I had one guy walk past me. I talk about him so bad, and then I just looked at him. I said, God bless you, sir. He walked past me, went down the street, come right back. He said, you know what, man, I had a bad day. He said, I'm sorry for even calling you that. He said, because I know you're a human being. He said, would you accept my party? I said, party to accept it. He went in his pocket and gave me 30 bucks and said, go get to the room and get you something to eat. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, no matter what people think about me, I know I'm a human first. And just because I'm down on my luck, don't give nobody no excuse to call me a ball. Because I'm not. So why do I show you this? For me, it changed my thought process. Okay? Now I'm not telling anyone that they need to give to everybody they see. I'm not telling you not to. It's obviously a personal decision. But this changed me because I have seen poverty, I'm sensitive to poverty, I've helped a lot of people in poverty, and yet I struggle with this exact situation. I don't like to just give money to go nowhere. I like to help people to, to help themselves, okay? It's just something to think about. There's a man by the name of Paul Tudor Jones. He's a hedge fund manager. It's worth $3.6 billion. 20-something years ago, he started a school system that helps kids that are on the street in bad neighborhoods, etc. He's learned a lot. He talks about it. If you want to look at it, go 60 Minutes. They just interviewed him. He has a foundation called Robin Hood. 
and he helps them. He does something about it. Now, I'm not a billionaire. I don't know if I ever will be. But we can all do something. We can all do something to better other people's lives, and I promise you that it will better your own life. Now, how does this directly apply to real estate investing? I'm going to invite someone down here who uses these principles in his everyday real estate investing. This is Andy McFarland. His brother provided this picture. I'll have him explain it. I'm not sure if he's collecting rent in a bad part of town or what. <laughs> uh, but we're going to have Andy come down here and he's going to tell you a little bit about how he uses this. So give him a big round of applause. here about six months ago, so some of you might have heard this already, but this is called my, those are called my spants. They're my shorts pants. So I used to work on a loading dock, and uh, these used to be, you know, just normal pants, but then I tore and stuff, so I just tore it off, you know, so my shorts pants, my spants. That was, that was a picture my brother had, he prepared the PowerPoint. So before I get into how I use it in real estate, Josh and I were having lunch a couple of weeks ago, and I had my wrist here, this thing you guys all have on your wrist. I turned it inside out because I don't want to like, you know, I just don't want me, I just don't like people reading me like, what's this all about, you know? So I had that, and I, I've had these for a few months, and it's just, it's a reminder to me that all those things you guys said in your stories of what makes you tick, everybody's here because we're out money, right? But it's not really, if you get down to the core of the stories that you guys had, it's about helping other people and things like that. So this, for me, is a, a visual reminder, and I actually give it to people, too. So um, I never tell anyone who or how or where it goes, and it's just different, different circumstances, but I'll give it to somebody, too. It's, my role, for me anyway, is somebody that I don't really know, generally. I want it to be something that they've never seen me before, they'll never see me again, and I give it to them without explanation after something has happened. And they're on their way. And I hope they look at that, and they make that ripple effect go forward. Right? That's the paying forward. We all can do that, small things, big things, that billionaire does it, and we can do it too. I mean, paying it forward can be to your kids, you know, that can be a huge effect on the generation. So anyway, that's how this whole thing came about, so I keep a lot of my goal is, I, I set a goal with this too. I, I set a goal to hand out one a week, and I hope I can be better than that. And I hope by some small part, everybody having one here today is exceeding my goal a little bit this year. Right? Well, that's a lot of weeks right there. I can't have all the right. right. And I hope you guys have a ripple effect, and you can get more of these if you want to. But go to the website if you want. So it was a friend of a friend that turned me on this whole thing. So anyway, how are you using real estate investing? I work with private sellers almost exclusively. I don't shop on the MLS. I do a lot of marketing, I go work with private sellers. My aha moment came that he was talking about, I talked to my wife about this a week ago, and I said, this is my aha moment, what I love to do. I love people, I love to help people, I love to hear their stories, and it directly correlates to my business because that's what I do. When I'm working with a private seller, I'll give you guys two examples today. When I'm working with private sellers, I'm about helping them. Um, in fact, I'm not going to tell that story. There's somebody here that knows my stories. And David, I'm sure that story you have bound for, you probably have a story with that too. But I'll give two stories. One of them happened yesterday with Josh, and another one happened a few weeks ago. So there was a guy I went to a house, and he had some other people on it, I think. But I went there, sat down, and I always talked to him. I want to know about them. What's your story? What are you trying to accomplish? How can I best help you? That's what it's all about for me. It's truly, and that's it. Whether or not I can make any money, that is secondary for me. First off is I want to help you, and they know that. They know that I'm not messing with them. I'm not some, you know, it's not a scam. I'm not trying to make millions of dollars on them. First and foremost, they say, how can I help you? Zig Ziglar said, and a lot of other people say, because it's a universal truism, if you help enough other people get what they want, you can get what you want. I kind of paraphrase that. You guys have heard that before? Have you heard that? That's my thing in my business. And it's not a scam. People say, well, how do you get these houses? How do you find these things? Because I go and I truly say, how can I help this person? So one of the stories, a few weeks ago, the guy's name, his name was Harry. So I went to his house, standard thing, you know, he had some equity, and he seemed to be motivated. So I sat down with Harry and I said, started asking this question. Big ears, right? Ken Garf or whatever that is on the freeway. Big ears. <laughs> That's what I wanted to know about is him. Give me your story. He said, look, I've been living here for a while. I don't really have much money. I want to move. He want to move to a trailer park. He's an older guy, he doesn't let, you know, doesn't use Google and stuff. So you want to move to the trailer park. Why? He started explaining all these things to me. I said, you have any money? You don't have any money. You use money from the house to the trailer park. So what did I ask him? How much money do you need all these things? Before we even talked about his house, what it's worth, because that's coming second. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to buy this thing for. He was probably surprised because I'm there to buy his house or do whatever. I'm some investor guy, right? 
for the first 30 minutes, we sat down there. He told me he wanted to do this. I said, well, where? Trailer Park? Yeah. In Salt Lake? Yeah. Have you seen a couple? Yeah. I pulled out my iPad because I bring it to everybody for reference and stuff. I Googled Trailer Park Salt Lake City. No. Eight of them came up. Pulled out my phone and we started calling. And he was just like, I'm not shocked by that, man. I started calling these trailer parks, asking the questions that he doesn't know how to ask. One, he doesn't know how to Google it. Two, he doesn't know how to ask these questions. I'm asking, what's the lot rent? What does that include? Single wides, double wides, any park home holds. I'm asking these questions he doesn't know how to do. In 30 minutes, I had eight parks from lined up. I knew what the lot rent was, if it was reasonable or not. There's single wide or double wides available, all that stuff. After that, we started talking about his house. Do you think he could tell that I wanted to help him? I take that approach with everybody. And whether or not I get a thousand on this house or a million dollars on this house, that doesn't matter. That's secondary to me. It's not how much money I can make. It's can I help this person? And if it ends up being, I tell people this all the time. It's not a, it's not a canned line for me. I say, if you were my dad, here's what I would tell you to do. Here's all your options. Or if you were my mom or my sister or my brother. And I'm saying that, it's not a sales pitch. It's honest. I would say, here are your options. And you know, this is probably a pretty good option for you. But hey, if you want to do that, how can I help you? How can I help you other than that, right? People feel that sincerity and they recognize I'm trying to help them. And actually, they'll tell people, why don't you listen? You know, why don't you do this? Your brother Joe wants to buy it? Sell it to Joe. You know, this was grandma's house. Why don't Joe buy it? But people feel that and I help them that way. The story from yesterday, this was totally random events. And sometimes I don't believe that they're random events. But anyway, serendipity, coincidence, whatever you want to call it. Um, Josh called me at the house that was going to auction. I said, hey, what do you think of this? Sometimes we'll bounce ideas on each other. You guys do this with all your friends, right? So, I said, yeah, you know, I'll look at it. I looked a little bit. I said, oh, it's you know, probably this and that. I said, oh, do you want to come to me tomorrow? We'll lunch. Yeah, sure, that's fine. So I show up at 10.30 at the auction box, right? He's doing his bidding, he's doing his thing. It ended up not working out that he could buy it. But the seller's there, right? Or not the seller, the owner of the home is there. You guys have been to auction and seen this. Sometimes they go there. So he's there. And after the fact, the bidding's done. Somebody else won. Josh was there. He starts talking. So we started talking to him. I said, hey, do you know this guy? And he was like, yeah, I know this guy. Basically, two and two came together, and basically, I don't know that I'm ever going to make any money in this, and Josh doesn't either, but I went out of my way and spent some time. I'm trying to help the guy out. I'm probably going to continue to help him out. I have no idea if he's going to be paycheck with that. I don't want a paycheck from him, necessarily. My aha moment with my wife was, I just like helping people, because I feel good about that at the end of the day. And I'm good at it, and I do make money at it, but that's not how I count my success. And like Matt said, you know, he's can retire or whatever. I do all right too. I'm not quite there with math, but I do all right. But I come home and I love those stories of how I can help somebody. So if you love doing that too, go out and help people. They'll feel that, pay it forward, and don't do it because you want something, because people will feel that. If you do that, you're gonna add value to others, whether it be an employee, whether it be you know somebody that's selling their house. You add value first, and then they'll give it back to you. Help enough other people get what they want, and they'll help you get what you want. I promise you guys that. So, yeah. Thank you. Andy is a very, very, very successful real estate investor, and that is why. I truly believe that. He's good. He's good at negotiating, too. Um, he's very good. Uh, okay. So you all have these wristbands. I'm not pushing that movement. It is a movement. You can look it up online. I think it's pifexperience.org. There's a video the guy started. He was very rich. Dropped it. Did this. He's trying to change the world, change lives. Just one person at a time. Um, I have it. Andy gave me mine. Now you all have one. So there's his goal for the next 150 days. Or weeks, sorry. <laughs> um, but it's just a reminder. It's something that the whole principle behind it is you give it to someone when you do something for them and just say, hey, you do the same thing. You help someone out. Pay it forward. Okay, so that's that thought. I'm going to end with two stories. Number one, there's a father, and his son came up to him. And this is an aha moment for me. I didn't have this experience myself, but this is exactly one of my moments. The boy came up to the dad and he said, Dad, how much do you make an hour? How much is your... How much do you make an hour? How much your time worth? He said, well, I make $50 an hour. He's like, all right, $50 an hour, that's about what a pharmacist makes. You can make $120,000 if you work five days a week. Um, and he says, well, can I, can I have 25 bucks? He's like, well, yeah, I guess. Why do you want 25 bucks? 
He says, because I already got 25 bucks, but I need 25 more so I can buy an hour's worth of your time. Because you don't spend any time with me. I'm very passionate about these things. And that's one thing that I will never hear from my children if I can do anything about it. Ever. It started at a young age for me. Like I told you, I grew up in Europe. I was a military brat, government brat. My dad uh, worked for the government over there. And in the school system, we lived off base. Anyone in the military here? You ever live overseas? Nobody? Okay. Turkey's a third world country. There's the rich and there's the poor. There's not really much of the middle class. And by our apartment building, there's a beggar. And this man, I need you to picture this, has no arms and no legs. I don't know if he was born that way or if it was because of some type of an accident. But he's basically a stump. And every day someone wheels him out in this little cart and sits him on the main busy walkway there and he begs. And I saw this man a lot, because it was right by our apartment building. But one day, our music teacher, we'd go out and perform for the Turks and their schools and stuff, and then they'd perform for us, we'd do some stuff like that. So we're going out to one of these performances, and the music teacher told us, everyone, I want you to bring a dollar. And he, he didn't tell us why. We had no idea why. And so we get on this bus, we're headed off base, we're going downtown, and all of a sudden he pulls over at this place where this guy is. And we had a choir and a band. I was in the band. Um, it's a small school, so we all know each other. Only about, my graduating class was 26. Gives you an idea. <laughs> anyway, so we pull over, he piles us out, and he tells us, okay, there's a guy here, and we're gonna sing him a few songs. And so we did a half circle around this guy because he was up against the wall, and I still remember every detail of this. Me and my buddy were there. We weren't in the choir, but we all circled around. We all start, we started singing them songs. As we kept going, we sang them one, we sang them another one. The guy was just in tears, just crying. That someone would stop and do something like this for him. And the music teacher pulls out a bag and says, okay, I want you all to put your dollars in here. Some people put 10 and 20. Some of us only brought a dollar. My best friend, I remember he put five. Um, we put him in this bag, and then we gave it to this man. And the average Turk, and this is a pretty good income, made about $80 a month. This is back in the 1990s. And we collected about $200 there, and we gave it to him. Me and my friends stayed around to make sure nobody even loved him and took it. And then some police came, so we had them watch it. The money changed the guy's life, but what brought the tears was us spending a few moments there, paying attention to him. That experience changed my life. And it didn't even necessarily change it that day. As I look back at that, I always remember that. That music teacher was my father. And he always did stuff like that. He'd pull over and help people. And I realized so I worked with Troubled Youth at Utah Boys Ranch, and I realized there that if you change a child's life, like I said in the beginning, you will change generations, and you will change the world. So it's something to think about. Can it help you in your investing? Absolutely. It'll help you in whatever you do. But just think about it, and always remember to pay it forward. Thank you.